you guys make your way back to your seats, you can go ahead and have a seat. Who's ready to get started? Everybody, everybody say Happy Easter. Happy Easter. We all have purple and pink and some color called mauve and whatever that is. And so you all, you all look amazing. Turn to your neighbor and say you look beautiful today because um, we're going to have a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, how many, everybody say move. move. How many of you um, are not from the city of Decatur, but you moved to the city of Decatur? Raise your hand. Outstanding. Welcome to the greatest city on the planet, in my opinion. Um, how many of you have ever moved at all? Moved from a house to another house, from city to another city? Okay, most of us understand what it means um, to move. Everybody say move. move. You move when you don't like necessarily where you are, and maybe it's that's not that you don't like it, but you see a better opportunity somewhere else, so you move to that place. Everybody say move. And whenever in life that that happens, there's something that you have to place all of your life. How many of you moved to discover things that you forgot you had? They were like in all these boxes and all this stuff, and you decided not to throw them away. So you had to rent something to move from one place to another. It, um, it's called Penske or U-Haul or something, but it's also called a moving Y'all are so intelligent. This is amazing. So when you want to move from where you are to where you would like to be, you have to get into a moving truck. You have to put all of your life into this massive um, vehicle, depending on how much life that you have to transfer from one place to another determines how big the truck is. Uh, but the bottom line is that anybody that's ever moved understands you go and you rent a moving truck and you place your whole life into this moving truck to get from where you are to where you want to be. I want to welcome you to an epic Easter. And today we're going to talk about, the title of the message is called Revenant. And if this is your first time with us or your first time back in a long time, I want to first say this before I move on. This is a two-week conversation. So I want to desperately invite you to join us next week because the message revolves around the reality of this. Where blood is lost, life is found. And the word revenant simply means one that has raised from the dead. We've got a lot of um, questions asked on social media. Are you playing the movie in church? What does that have to do with Easter? And actually it has everything to do with Easter. Revenant, one who was raised from the dead. I've personally seen the movie. If you've not seen the movie, let me set it up for you. It's a story about a father's love for his son, a father's pursuit of redemption on behalf of his murdered son. It starts in um, this father has a family. They live in a village, and their village is kind of raided, and, and everyone is killed except him and his son. And so all he has in his life is his child, his son. And they're trappers in the frontier, and that's how they make their living. And they team up with these guys, and they're supposed to guide them. And one of the men that they're guiding hates this father. He would be considered an enemy. And the story goes on, and you see them getting arguments, and there's tension in between them. <clears throat> because really, the father's enemy really wants to be him because he sees him as a good man. He sees him being able to do things that he can't do. And he, he really wants his life, and so he just hates him. And what happens in the story is the father is mauled viciously by a bear. And it injures him to the point that he can't take care of himself. And these men that he's guiding put him on a stretcher, and they begin to carry him around, hopefully to get him to safety. Well, the burden becomes too much, and this father's enemy makes a decision. He kills his son before his very eyes. And then he takes the father, his enemy takes the father, and he puts him in a super shallow grave and leaves him for what he believes to be dead. And the enemy goes on. Guided by the most powerful force in the universe that you and I know to be love, this father pulls himself from a shallow grave and is guided by this pursuit to find redemption somehow for his child. And really, that's not that hard for us to understand. How many of you in here have kids? Let me just ask you a question. If your child was in grave danger, what length would you go to to save them? If they were injured, what length would you go to to make sure that they were healed? 
If you knew they were about to be killed, what danger would you put yourself in to ensure their safety? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Easter. Easter is about the length that God himself went to to rescue his children. Because there is an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And because of God's love, he sent Jesus to rescue all of us, to make a way to move from pain to peace, from death to life, from sorrow to joy, and all that God asks us to do to move from where we are to where we want to be, to be rescued, to be saved, to be set free, is just get in God's moving truck. And maybe you ask, well, what is God's moving truck? The Bible puts it pretty simple. It's faith. It's trust. It's surrender. And can I be honest? You can't trust, have faith in, or surrender to someone you don't love. So what God asks of us is that we would love him. And we don't love him because we're awesome. The Bible literally says that we love God because he first loved us. That in this driving force of love, he sent Jesus to this earth to rescue us, to save us, if I'm honest, from us. This is the story of Jesus. This is the story of love. This, in effect, is the true revenant. Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There 
is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong, the blind can see, the lost are found. We had heard the stories of old, yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday. Would you stand and sing with us today?
Well, regardless of where you're at on your spiritual journey today, I just want to say again, thank you so much for choosing to be here on Easter. And um, like I said, maybe this is your first time ever uh, in a church, or maybe this is your, maybe you've been at Epic for a while, or maybe you've been away from Epic and you finally come back. Or when um, when I was growing up, we didn't we didn't go to church really ever. Um, but maybe you're, you would classify one of those people that come on um, Christmas and Easter, which makes you a creaster. Um, but really, where, wherever you gauge yourself on the spiritual journey, um, I, just, I want you to know this. If you don't hear me say anything else, God's, God himself, the God of the universe, is really excited that you're here. Um, whatever, whatever Sunday you choose to come, he's really excited that you made a decision to be in his house to, to hear his message. And um, the truth is, maybe the reason that you've been out of church for so long or you've never really given church a shot, but you're here today because somebody bribed you with Easter lunch, or maybe they even slipped you a 20 just to get you to come, but, or maybe you're just here to shut them up because you're sick of hearing about Jesus, and you're sick of hearing about Epic, and you think, if you'll just shut up, I'll go. Like, whatever, whatever reason you find yourself here today, I want to do something that I don't really know that I have the absolute authority to do, but I just feel led to do. I want to apologize for every person like me in a building called a church like this that's ever told you anything other than what I'm about to tell you from the Word of God. Because the truth is, we all have issues, don't we? How many of you in here have issues? Okay, everybody didn't raise their hand. That's your issue. But let, me, let me just be straight. That was my issue. You know what my issue was? I didn't think I had any issues. Like I thought I had it all together. I thought I was solid. I was very prideful. I was very arrogant. And maybe some people in here can relate to me. And if you're wondering if you relate to me, here's what you're going to say. I don't relate to you. I'm fine. <laughs> See, that's the issue. And, and then if you're here with like one of your friends or your relatives and you don't think you have any issues, do me a favor real quick. Ask them. They'll give you a list about this long of the issues that you have. And if you're a parent and you really want to find out if you have issues, ask your kids. It's posted in their room of all the issues that you have. They'd be glad to share it. with. So the truth is we all have issues. And 
And the sad reality to me and, and why we do church the way we do it, because probably you, maybe you're here and you've been stalking us for a year by iCampus and you finally figured out maybe it's moderately safe to go, so now you're here. The reason we do church the way we do is because the truth is you probably gave church a shot one time because you knew that was the way to give God a shot, or at least that's what you thought, and so you came and and somebody got on the stage and they got really mad and they sweat a whole lot and they got down and they kind of came up in the aisle and they made you feel like garbage. And so I want to apologize for that. Because when you're in the presence of God, let me tell you what you don't feel like. You don't feel like garbage and you don't feel condemned. <laughs> And most of the time when, when I would give church a shot, the guy would get up here and, and recite to me all the stuff I already knew. I knew I had issues. I knew I had, I pretended like I didn't, but maybe you're like me. In the dark recesses of your mind when it's late at night or early in the morning, we all know we have issues. We all know we have problems. And, and I tell people this all the time. Aren't you so glad your issue is culturally accepted? Or aren't you so glad you can moderately successfully hide your issue from the rest of the world? Because the truth is we all have them. And God saw fit to rescue us from our issues. And he didn't do it by sending us a list of rules. He didn't do it by saying, stop doing that and start doing this. Because the truth is, if that worked, we wouldn't be here. If I could fix me, I would have never embraced Jesus as my forgiver and leader. If I'm just honest... If that's too real for you, I apologize, but this is the truth. If we could fix ourselves, then God would have never went to the trouble of sending Jesus. And Romans chapter 3, where we're going to pick up today, is where God in his infinite wisdom explains that to all of us. He says this, but in our time, everybody say my time, but in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophet witnessed to all those years has happened. So many people come to church and they believe God took Xanax somewhere between Malachi and Matthew and got happy. It's like, wow, hippie Jesus showed up. Now God loves everybody. I don't, what happened? No, no, what, what the writer of Romans, God himself is saying is, I've always been the same. And all that Old Testament stuff that scares you and confuses you points you to a time where I'm going to do something where I step into your world and your reality and fix what you can't fix. And the writer goes on. God setting things right. What we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference since we've all compiled this long and sorry record as sinners and proved that we're utterly incapable of living out the glorious life that God wills for us. We know you have a list of sin 20 years long. And tell me you know you're utterly incapable of living this life that is often talked about in the Bible, but you really want it. You just don't know how to get it. The next phrase says this, well, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on the altar of the world to clear the world of sin Having faith in Jesus sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This is not only clear, but it's now. It's current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. 
This is the good news, guys. It's where God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and we so many times try to do it. We try to create and rent our own moving truck to get us from where we are to where we want to be, only to discover I end up in a location that I never planned on being, and God says, I've sent my moving truck, Jesus, to take you from where you are to where you really want to be and get this, where God himself really wants you to be. God sacrifices Jesus. Where blood was lost, life really is found. There is a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And you know what's cool? Regardless of where you're at on your spiritual journey, you know that. You know there's something at work in the world that causes you to fall short, to feel like you're dying, to feel like you don't measure up, to always. Do you ever just wake up one morning and just feel depressed and down? There's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came that you would have life. Jesus would say, I gave my life so that you could have life. The love of God is what drove God to send Jesus to this planet to do this for you. And maybe I want to read a pretty famous verse. It's John 3, 16. Have you ever heard that verse read? And I want to apologize again because a lot of times that verse is read to make you feel bad. You ever, have you ever, ever had that verse delivered to you in a way to scare you? Can I, can I be honest with you on this, this Easter Sunday? God's not a scarer. He's a savior. He, he, doesn't, he hasn't drawn you to this place to scare you, to come down an aisle, to, to make some kind of decision out of fear that he's going to judge you. And I'm going I'm to prove to you out of scripture where God didn't send Jesus to judge you. God sent Jesus to save you. Because the message he delivers to you is one of love and hope and mercy and grace. So in the light of that reality, let me read John 3.16 to you. It says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And every pastor stops right there. If you're like super Christian, that's all you've memorized. But it goes on in verse 17. And verse 17 is the good news of verse 16. It says this, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. And then verse 18, it builds on the good news. Listen to this. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged. For what? For not believing in him. Can I give you some really good news? I need everybody to dial in. God didn't send Jesus in this world to judge you. He sent Jesus into this world to save you. Because you want to know why? God doesn't need to judge you because we judge ourselves. How many of you know that? How many of you know your list? How many of you know your struggle? How many of you know your sin? When I, when I, would, go to, when I would go to church and I would sit and the pastor would get sweaty hot and rant and rave and start shouting and tell me how awful I was, I would say, I know. I got that. I'm really good at that. Tell me something I don't know. Where's the good news? Where's the hope? Where's the love that I so hear about all the time? I don't need you to tell me how awful I am because I already know how broken I am. I already know I fall short. I already know if earning is how you get in, I'm out. Because every time I try, I mess up. So today's conversation is not about how broken we are. It's about how good he is. Because that's honestly what you need to know, isn't it? That's why you came. You haven't been to church maybe in years, weeks, months, decades. And you thought, today, I'll give it one more shot. Can I tell you, God loved you so much that he sent hope in the name of Jesus that despite your brokenness, despite your sin, despite where you're at, he would move you from where you are to where you really want to be. He just asks that you get in his moving truck. 
And honestly, if Jesus just stopped at dying, we might as well pack up and go home. Because there are self-proclaimed gods all over this planet that taught some moderately cool stuff and died, and they're still in the grave, and there's no victory in them. There's no need to worship them because they have no power to change your life. But Jesus didn't stop by dying. He said, it's finished, because he knew it would be. And in, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says this, death swallowed up by triumphant life. Who got the last word, O death? O death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening and law cold guilt that gave sin its leverage and its destructive power. But Jesus himself overcame sin and death one time, once and for all, not because of the cross, but because of the resurrection. He's not in the grave, guys. I've been there. I went to Israel, and you ever, you ever go somewhere just knowing you're going to feel the presence of God? And like if you're new to this, that stuff you're feeling right now that you're trying to touch, and you think it's the fog machine because you're not really sure what's happening in here, but you know there's something in here, that's the very presence of the living God. And sometimes there's places that we go and we go, man, I can't wait to feel the presence of God. I thought it would be that way when I went to Jesus' tomb, and I've been to it. And I stood inside of it. And I could not wait to get there because I just thought there would be this overwhelming presence of the living God in this place. He's so not there that his presence not even there. Like when he left the tomb, he left the tomb. Jesus has left the tomb. He's not even remotely there. And that's what gives us victory. And it was the love of God that drove him to pursue his prize creation, his children by sending Jesus to die and pay a price for our brokenness. And he didn't stop. The love that Jesus had in his heart for the Father and for you drove him to come out of a very shallow grave where a heavy stone was set to lock him in and guards were set around to ensure that nobody stole the body. And he knocked the guards flat. He rolled the stone away and he walked out so that you and I could be free from the penalty of sin and death and have victory and freedom for the rest of eternity. This is not something you get for just a little while. Jesus didn't do all that for you to get fire insurance. There's so many people like me preach about fire insurance. That's not the gospel, guys. Jesus said... I came that you may have life and have it to the fullest now. You don't, you don't have to. Man, I can't wait till I get to heaven one day. Listen, I'm fired up about going to heaven, but honestly, because Jesus saved me and set me free, I'm fired up about now. I'm fired up about tomorrow. My life is unbelievable because I came to the end of me and discovered him. He's not there, guys. He's risen. He died and overcame. He wore your chains to set you free so that you could experience not pain, not sorrow, not defeat, but peace, victory, and joy, and life. Stand and sing with us. Thank you.
So we're singing about the grave being empty today. Let's sing it in belief together. You roll the stone away. We see the empty grave. We lift our hands and say, Hallelujah. You roll the stone. Hallelujah. 
I love the words of that song. It says, if not for nails, if not for blood, if not for mercy, if not for love, where would we be? Where would I be if not for hope, if not for grace, if not for the power to take my place? I don't know where you are in this moment, but I can promise you I would not be where I stand today, where my marriage is, where my entire life is without the nails, without God's mercy, without God's love, and without Jesus' victory. I read to you the first part of 1 Corinthians 15, 51, where it's saying, death, where is your sting? I want to read to you the last part. It starts out by saying, but now. Everybody say, but now. If you're new to Bible reading or you're new to church, I just want to encourage you, you really need to pay attention and enjoy the butts in the Bible. Because it's right there. Some of you like butts, that's okay. It's right there. Where God is saying, this is where you are. But now this is where I'm taking you. This this is where you were, but because you got into my moving truck, but now this is who you are. This is what you have. A fallacy sometimes in speaking is we say this, you can have what the Bible says you can have. If you embrace Jesus as your forgiver and leader, it's not that you can, it's that you do. If you've embraced Jesus as your forgiver and leader, the Bible never, ever calls you a sinner ever again. It says, but now you are a child of God. You were once a sinner, but now you are a child of God. I love this. It says, you were once blind, but now you can see. You were once dead, but now you're alive. The but now is the good news. And the Bible says, But now, in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone. The gift of Jesus is life. I don't know if you caught it. The Bible does not say, in a single stroke of death, It actually says, in a single stroke of victorious life, God offers you life. Based on Jesus' death and his resurrection, based on Jesus' sacrifice and his victory, God offers you that same victory, that same freedom, that same joy, that same peace. And all he asks, very simply put, is would you get in his moving truck of faith so that he can take you from where you are to where you want to be. And I know coming in here for like, this is your first time or maybe your third time, this is, this is a little much. Let's just be honest. Like you've been bumped at some point during a song and you're sitting next to your friend and they're losing their mind and you're thinking, if you bump me one more time, I'm punching you when we get out of here. I told, told, I told you I would come to church if you'd be calm and you're not holding up to your I came and you're losing your mind. Or, or like you just thought you'd come and you, you sit next to that person and you're thinking that you haven't heard anything I've said because you've watched them the whole time. They're going, hey, man, hallelujah, praise. And you're like, what? You are so weird. <laughs> it's, is it not true? And listen, when I, came, when I first started coming to church, I would come to church and I'd see people doing that. They'd be raising their hands or they'd be clapping at what I thought was the wrong time. You ever notice that? People clap at the wrong time or they clap off beat or they like you just, you're totally judging the crowd. I was doing that. And, and here's what I was, here's what, I don't know if you can relate to this, but here's where I was at. I was like, okay, I can tell you're excited. I can tell you have a little something that I don't have and I want that. But I don't want to be weird. Is there a way to have Jesus and not be weird? And this was my conversation with God before I was ever saved, guys. This is the lost me having a conversation with the God of the universe. And a lot of people will tell you, oh, you can't hear the voice of God if you're lost. That's a lie. 
God's everywhere all the time, speaking to all people everywhere, drawing him, drawing them to himself. And I was having a conversation as I was struggling with this whole message of the gospel. So you're telling me I can be free from the things that go on inside of me? Are you telling me I don't have to deal with depression? Are you telling me you can fix my brokenness? Are you telling me that all those thoughts that I have all by myself and I know my list and I know how sinful I am, are you telling me all I got to do is believe and you're going to take me from where I'm at to something greater than I can imagine? And the answer was always yes, but honestly, I was like, I still want to be weird. And now I'm weird. So I get it. I understand. I've only been saved, rescued, redeemed, made whole again for 17 years. Eight of it, I've been the lead pastor of this church, which should make you feel really good or really scared. I don't know which one it should make you feel. So I don't really understand the church thing. All I know is Jesus saved me. Amen. And my family and I's greatest desire is that you would experience that. Not religion, not a building, not a set of rules, but freedom through the life that Jesus offers you. And all God says is trust in me believe that what I've done is enough and I'll move you from where you are to where you really want to be. And as I was going through this journey, we'd come and I'd see people raise their hands and, and I'd see people like jump and clap and do all this stuff and I was like, why on God's green earth are you doing this? Aren't you, supp aren't you supposed to come to church and be like, Amen. Amen. That's right. that's right. And like, that's it. And God began to show me things. And I'm just being completely transparent. And maybe as a preacher, you're not supposed to do that. But this is just who I am. I, I be, God began to speak to me and show me things. I mean, you know when you go to the bar? I don't, like, I don't know if it's uncomfortable to you, but your pastor used to go to a bar a lot. And I would, would go on Wednesday night because me and me and Benet were together, and it was ladies' night. So we go on Wednesday night at ladies' night. Anybody ever been to ladies' night? Don't raise your hand. Because we go to ladies' night. We go on Friday night because there was, you know, dollar beer or whatever. And we go on Saturday night because that was $2 shots. And then sometimes on, I'm just being, and we would go on Sunday afternoon because you could take dance lessons. And I was really trying to learn how to dance because she's hot and she could dance. And I wanted her to love me. And so we, listen, listen, our church service our church service was in the bar Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon. And you're like, oh my gosh, but you calling that church service? Yeah, you know why? Because I would worship my face off. I would hold my Bud Light really high in the air, and I would shout as the band was playing a song that I felt like connected me to something bigger than me because my life wasn't going the way I wanted it to go. So I would go and drink five, six, eight beers, hold it high, and do the drunk shout that we've all done and worship something that was unworthy of my worship. So I get it. I've been where you are. You, you want to know why people lose their mind and, and you, run, you run around your living room when Alabama wins the national championship, but yet you come to church and somebody dances in the aisle and you're like, hey, you need to calm down. <laughs> yeah, but you were just in your living room on a Saturday night losing your ever-loving mind running around because somebody scored a touchdown and got to hold the national. You, do you want to know why that is? You want to know why you hold your Budweiser so high and shout? You want to know why you shout for a national championship team? Because you were created to be connected to something bigger than you. You were created to be connected to the champions of cha You know deep inside you're not supposed to walk in defeat. You're to live a life of victory and you're to worship and live for something bigger than what you're experiencing right now. And so you go to these places just like I did that offer you this temporary moment of satisfaction, but then you wake up the next day and you go, ah, oh, it's gone. And you go back, and you go back, and you go back, and listen for you. Maybe it's not the bar. Maybe it's your job. 
You don't want to be at home because home doesn't deliver the excitement that your job does. Or maybe for you it's money. You chase money wide open because the regular life doesn't give you the excitement. Maybe you're married but you are having an affair because you found that your marriage is not giving you the excitement so you're constantly chasing. Can I tell you something? You don't have a marriage problem. You don't have a job problem. You don't have any other thing that the world would tell you. You have a spiritual issue. And God knows that. And he didn't send Jesus into the world to die on the cross and resurrect to judge you for that. He came to heal you from that. Yes. To deliver you from that. And God's delivery system is faith, trust, surrender. So why do, why do people in here bump you? Why do they praise the name of Jesus and talk about Jesus and glorify God all the time, it's because, very simply put, they were once blind, but now they see. They were once dead, but now they're alive. And no one, no one who was dead and became alive worships God with their hands in their pockets Nobody who was blind. Nobody who was blind. If you were blind and now you see, you're pretty doggone excited about it. Like so. So when you and when you're, if you're like I was, and you come in here and you, you judge these people for bumping you and raising their hands. Can we just we bridge the gap a little bit? We do it for the one who is worthy. And if I'm honest, when you're away from him. You do it for the thing that's not worthy. And I understand that. So Easter is the invitation where God enters your space through the power of the gospel and says, would you worship the one who is worthy? The one who his love drove him to send Jesus to die for you. The one whose love drove him to overcome sin and death. The one whose love wouldn't allow death to hold him, but he would walk free from that, offering you the same freedom, the same power, and the same victory because he alone, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he alone is worthy to be praised. He alone is worthy to be lifted high. And if you lift high the name of Jesus, here's the promise, and it's going to happen in about three minutes. People will come and receive him as the gift of salvation and freedom. Stand to your feet, church. Praise the name of Jesus. Drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah stood and all
Ephesians chapter 2 says this, For it is by grace you're saved through faith. This is not of yourself, but this is the gift of God. I believe with all my heart that God sent Jesus to rescue some people in this place tonight. And he's inviting you to get on his moving truck. He's asking you, would you trust me with your life? Would you believe? I think there's some people ready to move from where you are to where you want to be. Everybody say move. It's time to move from death to life. It's time to move from pain pain to peace, from sorrow to joy. Everybody say move. It's time to move in Jesus' name. Would you place your trust in him and him alone? Worship him because he is worthy. for you to bow your heads and close your eyes all over the auditorium. um, A couple of people I want to speak to in this room tonight. For some of you, you're ready to move. You've never experienced this before. You've never heard it this way before. And there's something tugging at you. That's, That's God opening the door to his moving truck and saying, jump in. And you're ready to move. And if I could be honest, there's some of you, you treat God like a vacation home. You're trying to live in two houses. You're trying to hold on to your past house and visit the house that God made for you on the weekend or once a month. And I'm not talking about this building, guys. I'm talking about the place of peace that you visit every once in a while, the place of joy that you visit every once in a while. And the reason that is is because you got one hand and one foot in your past. You're trying to hold on to it, and you got one hand trying to hold on to where God wants to take you, and you're stuck in the middle. And let me tell you, that's the most miserable place to be. We all understand when we move, we have to leave that house behind You can't keep driving by looking at it. You can't go back and visit it. You can't even go back and stay in it. That house was sold. That house was bought with a price and it was sold and you no longer live there anymore and now you've been given a new place to live. It's time to move in. Move in one time, once and for all. If there's two people that make a, need to make a decision and the decision is the same. Move. 
The Bible says the way that you do that on Romans 10, 9 is if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, rescued, redeemed. You will be moved from death to life, from brokenness to wholeness, from pain to peace, from sorrow to joy. For it is with the heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith, and you are saved. I wonder if there's anybody in this auditorium that's ready to move. If that's you, I want to ask you to do something. Would you raise your hand wherever you're at in this room? Raise it really, really high all over this room. Raise it super, super high. The Bible's clear, simple. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you're going to move. So I'm going to count to three. I want you to do something. I want you to physically move today. I want you to step out into the aisle when I count to three. Come down front and let one of our staff pray with you and just celebrate the fact that you're moving from where you are to where you want to be. One, two, don't be afraid. If you're 15 people in, they bumped you all night, bump them and come out into the aisle and come on down front and receive Jesus as your Savior. Three, step out, come on down front, receive Jesus as your Savior. It's time to move. Don't stay where you are. Don't stay in the middle. It's time to move. One time, once and for all. Move. Move in the name of Jesus all over this auditorium by the power of the gospel. Move. sorrow to joy, from death to life, from pain to peace. Behold, God says, I make all things new. All the old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new.
as these are being prayed for down front, receiving Jesus in this moment, I just want to speak um, to some people that are probably in the room and you came here and this was completely not what you expected an Easter service to be. You really weren't sure what to expect, but there's no denying that, that something has moved in your life and, and you may not be a church person or maybe you've been uh, away from church for a while, but let's just be honest. Taking that jump and putting your whole life into God's moving truck by faith and trusting Him and, and making that step seems a little scary to you. Um, at, this, at this stage of your journey, um, as a pastor of this church, I just want to say this. That's okay. I want to ask you to do something for me because here's what Jesus would say. Jesus wouldn't say, start this, stop this, change this, do this. He would simply say, follow me. Watch me do some things. Watch me say some things. Watch how I interact with people. And the fact that Jesus is not here in the flesh anymore, he sets up his church. It's called the body of Christ. And so... I would just like for you to come and hang out with the body of Christ and watch what we do and watch what is said here and come and feel and experience the presence of God and get some questions answered. And we're, we're not scared of your doubts and we're not scared of your questions and we're not scared of where you're at on your journey here at Epic, but here's what's cooler than us not being scared of it. God's not scared of it either. I told you this when we started. He's really, really excited that you chose to be here today, and he has been pursuing you your whole life. Would you come next week? And would you come the next Sunday? And the next Sunday? And let's just do life together, and let's watch God do something amazing in your life and in my life and our lives collectively as we pursue him to live life to the fullest. So church, if you would, of all those that came down front, you witnessed the miracle of the resurrection of the dead on Resurrection Sunday. Would you give Jesus a round of applause for all that he did today in your presence?